Leslie Marshall, real people, real life, real talk. Lee, um, a struggle in this country when it comes to education, you know, whether it's a voucher program to add more money, less money, uh, change size of classrooms. And one of the issues is standardized testing. Um, my understanding, Dr. Gross, and correct me if I'm wrong, is you're one of those who is an, uh, I don't want to say advocate, but a proponent and someone who agrees and feels that there is value in standardized testing. Am I correct? Yes, there's absolutely a value. Of course, everything is in context. You know, we want balance in everything we do in education, and one of our problems in education is this out-of-balance situation we've been in since the 70s. But actually, two standardized tests a year, not 15 or not every other year, but two a year in the fall and in the spring, the way it used to be when you were young and I was young, these kinds of testing experiences give information to both the teacher and the child and we cannot remediate we cannot create a curriculum we can't help children if we don't know where they are if we don't know if they've picked up the information we've taught them and if they can replicate that information and transfer transfer um, form it by transferring it that's the only way they we know if they've learned and it is the only way they have learned you, uh, uh, you, you wrote in the field of education, knowledge is power. I agree with that 100%, although <laughs> cliche, it's very true. And you talk about a New York Times article that we're going to talk about. We're going to take a quick break and come back. That's the short segment in this hour. Uh, when we come back, we'll continue our conversation with Dr. Gail Gross, a nationally recognized family and child development expert, author, and educator. Her positive and integrative approach to difficult issues helps families navigate today's complex problems. She's frequently called upon by national and regional media to offer her insight on topics involving family relationships education as she is tonight, behavior and development issues. She is a dependable authority, has contributed to broadcast, print and online media, including CNN, Fox is the O'Reilly Factor that you guys see me on nearly every week, MSNBC, The New York Times and USA Today, ABS, ABS, New Network, ABS, ABC, CBS, that's combining those two. Give it time. ABC, CBS and KHOU, Great Day Houston show. I used to live in Houston, 1992, when I was five. She, uh, just joking, she is a veteran radio talk show host as well as the host of the nationally syndicated PBS program, Let's talk. I'm a PBS fan. Good to have Dr. Gail Gross with us. Check out her website, drgailgross.com. Follow her on Twitter at Dr. Gail Gross. That's G-A-I-L-G-R-O-S-S. Back to her and you right after this. And we're back. I'm Leslie Marshall. Welcome or welcome back. We welcome Dr. Gail Gross, human behavior and education expert. And we're talking about the value of standardized testing. Dr. Gross, thank you for holding and welcome back. We were talking and I started to mention a New York Times article um, that you have mentioned uh, in um, the Huffington Post piece that I was reading that outlined new legislation that's potential uh, new legislation in the state of Texas. House Bill 866. Now, like I said, I used to live in Houston. We're nationally syndicated. I'm also on TV nationally. So I care about not just the state I live in, which is California. Now, this bill would, and correct me if I'm wrong, doctor, because I'm a liberal, but I had to take a double take on this. This would allow elementary school students who excel at state reading and math exams in third and fourth grade to skip exams in those subjects in the fourth, sixth, and seventh grade. Now, I am not an educator. I'm not a researcher. I try to educate Republicans how to become Democrats when I'm on Fox three, four times a week. But other than that, um, you as an educator, you as a researcher, you who have this education, you who have a doctorate um, and um, specialize in curriculum, specialize in, in instruction, um, and, and having studied a, a lot of your career, the way children learn, what is your response and what was your response to this when you, when you first heard about this? You know, it, it's so interesting that this this came up because it's, such a problem in education. Everyone's an expert because everyone's gone to school. You know, that's cliche, but we say it all the time. And they come up with these different kinds of bills that with really no thinking long term or no knowledge. I also have a PhD in psychology. And anyone who knows education or psychology knows that at the, these levels, children are in a place we call transitional. They're changing from concrete operations to abstract operations. What that means is if they have any problems that are going to come up that have just been suppressed until then, they come up now and you start seeing children have headaches and stomach aches, not wanting to go to school, not sleeping well at night, and not being able then to perform in school on pro problems that are math and science, things that have abstract thinking 
aligned with them. So to not find out what's going on with children at this most transitional period is ridiculous. I just can't even believe that they've come up with something like this. And there are so many consequences for that neglect. And at the end of the day, you know, we have to meet children where they are. But we first have to know where are they. We can't just throw things at children and just hope that they're getting it and not finding out if they can uh, uh, repeat what they've been taught. So it's a ridiculous approach, and it's, it's again, one of these exaggerated knee-jerk reactions, this overdrive that happens because nobody seems to know what to do. And really, if you look at the country of Finland, for example, they have a great educational system, and they've worked it out through the teacher process. They realize that teachers, first of all, have to teach, and teachers, we have to have ways of measuring that. They have to be course uh, proficient. They have to, if they're going to teach science, they have to know science. If they're going to teach math, they have to know math. If they're going to teach reading, they have to be able to read. And therefore, they scan their country, and the top 10% become teachers, and the top 10% have masters in teaching and in the subjects that they're teaching. So they've brought their, country, their educational system up to be one of the top educational systems in the country and in the world, uh, not in the country, but uh, in relation to other countries and in the world. And they did this when they are, you know, 40 years ago when they were having an economic downturn, just like we are, and, and they took that as an opportunity to bring up their educational system. And they use whatever it takes to get that child to learn. The important focus is on the child, but also the education of the teacher. And we cannot let children keep passing through the system without being able to read, being able to write, being able to have the skills by which to live. And so it's important for us to pay attention to these bills, to the things that are passing by. I've spent 25 years studying education and the way children learn and stress. And two achievement tests a year consistently will absolutely give us the information we know. A good standardized test has bias built into it, so we know if there's bias. It's got reliability. It's got, you know, I taught statistics to Ph.D. candidates in Malaysia. Good statistics, good standardized testing gives us a criteria for reliability, replication, transfer of knowledge, and it has a validity with the bias built in. So we don't have to be afraid of tests. We just have to give them less often, but consistently twice a year in the spring and the fall so we know where we're going and so we know where we, where we are so we know where to go. Let's take some calls and we go to Dwayne in Kentucky. Dwayne, thank you for joining us. Good evening. Question or comment for our guest, Dr. Gail Gross, regarding standardized testing and regarding education. Good evening. Well, good evening, Leslie, and good evening uh, to a fellow colleague, uh, Dr. Gross. Uh, I am a retired uh, social worker, child uh, and adolescent psychotherapist, uh, retired, and uh, I, uh, I echo her uh, agreement that uh, uh, schools should only have uh, a pre-test, post-test concept uh, and not these uh, – massive uh, year-end testing that the state imposes upon children because I have two children. They're both adults now, and I have a, a very big love of history, and I've had it all my life, and my two children now, uh, one is a uh, ICU nurse, and my son is now studying to be a teacher. And they both have no concept of history. They have had to struggle with history all through their academic uh, career. And I find that very tragic. And I find it very disturbing that the various states are now imposing this uh, mandate on our teachers to uh, require that our educators teach 
and I, I It is, uh, it is literally a tragedy what we have done to our education system. I, I agree with you there, uh, uh, Dwayne in Kentucky. Uh, Dr. Gross, did you want to respond to uh, Dwayne, our caller, and your colleague? Well, yes. You know, Dwayne, I really have come to, to the conclusion that we have to standardize the curriculum that teachers have. You can't have a teacher in one state teaching creationism and in another state, teaching Darwinism, and expect our children to get a healthy education that's uniform. We have to have teachers, whether they go to Harvard or whatever uh, state-operated university, they have to have the same curriculum. And then we have to have a certification that's standardized to measure whether these teachers have learned a standardized curriculum so that at the end of the day, when your teacher, your child's teacher, is teaching history and walks into the classroom, they know history. You can't have someone teaching history who doesn't, but right now we do. And this is the problem. We have teachers from all different kinds of educational backgrounds, many from very deficient universities, getting very deficient educations. And sadly, children from the lower economic levels end up with these teachers, the ones that need the best teachers. The best program out there is Teach for America, where these kids that are graduating college and have a passion for teaching and really are expert in teaching enter the educational world and really help these kids learn. And they stick with the kids. The KIPP Academy in New York and in Houston and in all various 150 different places now in the United States. That program is a wonderful program. What does it do? It sticks with these children right through college, and it gets them there. At the end of the day, it's the, we have to get teachers who can teach, and there are a lot of good teachers out there, but they need the support of the community. There needs to be a, col- a collaborative event rather than a competitive event. Dr. You Dr. Know, Dr. Gr- uh, Dr. Gross, I have a, a lot of questions before you know we, we, we go off a, a lot of places here. Uh, one is, so that people understand, when, what is happening in Texas, one of the reasons it bothers me is kids change physically in the years that they are talking about skipping. Kids become curious about different things, especially in that age group. You would know this more so than I. Sex, um, alcohol, drugs, other experimentation. Their bodies are changing. Their hormones are raging. Um, you know, they're going through puberty. Uh, they're often confused. Uh, the list goes on. Some of these children also, when they test high, may be great students because everything's great at home. Unfortunately, life is not perfect, and some of these children's might, might, children might experience uh, some bad things that could occur when, when they get older. So I, I think that, I mean, you know, kid can be a straight-A student when they're 12 and things drastically change by the time they're 15. Um, so this is one of the things I think you're speaking to. Mark uh, texts, uh, Mark Oliver texts, it is important to have standardized testing to ensure that if someone moves to a different state, they have the same skills. And, and I think that's important to remember, too, because we do have people, whether, the, you know, it used to be just people whose parents were in the military moved around a lot. That's not the case anymore. People move because they have more affordable homes in a different state, a job opportunity. Uh, they get transferred. Uh, they, they, you know, it's, it's very common for kids not to grow up and live in the same house for 18 to 20 years. Yes, that speaks to my point, really. That's exactly how I feel. You're very insightful. <laughs> you know, we need to have standardized curriculum. We can't be teaching creationism in one place and Darwinism in another. On the other of the point that you're very, you're also very insightful about the changes that children are going through in these very ages where they're talking about not finding out where their levels are and if they've learned anything and, and what we need therefore to remediate or teach. And uh, there, this is the period of moving from concrete operations where, you know, the famous Piaget studies where a child doesn't recognize whether uh, a volume in a long cylinder or a short cylinder is equal if it's the same amount of volume because it looks like it's more in the long c- cylinder. And so they move from that to being able to 
be critical thinkers and think abstractly and recognize that the volume can be the same and the cylinder is just different. So children are changing in the way they perceive the world. Therefore, if they have problems at home, you know, drive-by shootings, incest, uh, abuse, alcoholism, divorce, all the baggage kids come to school with to start with that we have to address, never, never mind that, they, they, children learn to manage that in a way through fantasy and rationalization until around the fourth grade. When they move into this place we call abstract operations, then this stuff starts surfacing and they start having problems, very much what you just said. And as a result, they have stomach aches and headaches and they can't sleep well and all of this affects their way, their way of learning. So we need to know it is knowledge is power. Where are they? So we can figure out how to help them. That's what's changed in our schools today. You know, we've thrown so much at education. Open concepts, which didn't work. New math, which didn't work. All of these things which we knew nothing about, but we just tried the next gimmick. And now we're doing it with computers, the new gimmick. But at the end of the day, we have to teach children. And we have, we have to know what the child, who the child is. We can't have schools of 5,000 kids in them and have these children be anonymous. And I, the, I really want to bring up again this Finland model, because in this little country, they are doing, they're competing with all the largest countries in the world. And, 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 we're, de and we're definitely having a problem with competition, especially in the area of math and science uh, and even computers in some regard. Uh, when we look at India, we look at China, and we look at not only the advancements, we look societally within the family how essential education is, how, how that, uh, that is very important, how uh, not being uh, the head cheerleader or captain of the football team matters uh, culturally uh, to the Chinese and to the Indians, but uh, coming home and being a straight-A a student certainly does, and my husband's family's from India, so I'm married to somebody from that culture, and I, I know it well. Dr. Gross, l let me ask you something, because one of the things that bothers me about standardized testing is when I was a kid, about five or six, a lot of kids had standardized testing to tell them what their IQ was, their intelligence quotient. And I didn't think this was such a good idea, because in the case of my brother, he has near a genius IQ, they told him, and so he never studied. <laughs> but and I think kids don't understand that IQ is like a quart of milk, and there's not only a quart, uh, always a quart of milk inside. It can go up and down, and uh, that you know you need to still uh, some kids need to apply themselves more um, than others. Um, but what you're, what you're 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 talking about standardized testing. It's not just you know a, a broad spectrum test that tells somebody like an aptitude test what they'd be good at employment wise, which I think anybody can kind of figure out. Like me, faint at the sight of blood, you're not going to go into medicine, but. When, when, you, when you look at the, these are tests, these standardized tests are to see where, where kids are excelling, see where kids are falling behind, see where they need more help, see where things need to be tweaked. It's, it's not to keep kids back. It's not to reward and punish teachers. It is to get a full picture of each individual student, which a test alone can't do any more than just the teacher's assessment alone can do, correct? You're, you're exactly right. You're talking about a diagnosis. If you go to a doctor, uh, it, it, he can't worry about if it's going to make you feel uncomfortable to know that you have a very big disease. He has to be able to say to you, I have to talk to you. You, have your, your, uh, you need to know this so that we can now make you better. And that's what this is. It's an achievement test. It's a diagnosis. It says, did you learn this material? If you didn't, we need to remediate you so that you can move on or maybe not move on. But we have to figure out what, how we can help you. First, we have to have the information. It's a diagnosis. And you know what you said about different cultures was right on, Leslie. If you look at Japan and Germany, we're always comparing our educational system against Japan and Germany. Where did they get their educational system? They got it from us. After we bombed them in World War II, we reconstructed their cultures after the infrastructure was gone, and we therefore created their educational system. A absolutely. Dr. Rose, we appreciate you being with us. I'm sorry we have to cut you off, but that's the end of the hour. We have to take a break and talk radio news services standing by in Washington and our nation's capital uh, with a news report. Thank you very much for joining us. Dr. Gail Gross, be sure to follow her at Dr. Gail Gross and go to her website, Dr. Gail Gross.